Hey everybody, uh, to the sounds of birds on one of the most peaceful parts of the Gettysburg battlefield, we find ourselves here during Gettysburg 160 uh, near John Sedgwick's monument on North Sedgwick Avenue. Uh, we're just north of Little Round Top, which is off to your left. Uh, the Pennsylvania Monument and the, you know, clump of trees is going to be about a mile to the north, and we're looking generally westward toward the Confederate line and scene of the intense Confederate attack on July 2nd, 1863. We got Chris White behind the camera there, and we've got a gaggle of guests here, one of whom I'm going to bring on right now because we're going to talk about a lot of people's favorite general. We're talking about Uncle John Sedgwick. Let's bring on Sarah K. Byerly of the American Battlefield Trust. Tell us about John Sedgwick a little bit. Sure. Thanks, Gary. So John Sedgwick is 49 years old at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg. He's commanding the 6th Corps. And we're going to have some of our other folks talking a little more about the 6th Corps, but let me just give you a hint. If you're reading about battles in the East, keep in mind if the 6th Corps is somewhere in the area, keep a watch for them because sometimes they are a corps that's going to prove the difference for the Union Army and the Potomac. But it's interesting when we get a description of Union generals. What did they look like? You know, we look at their portraits and sometimes they've really cleaned up for those photographs that they've had taken. What did they look like to their officers, to their staff, to the men who saw them? And we've got a great description of John Sedgwick, Uncle John Sedgwick, as he's sometimes called um, by his men. And this comes from his chief of staff, uh, Martin Thomas McMahon, and he makes this description after the war to an artist named, named James Kelly, who's doing interviews with officers, trying to make sure that his art is going to be as authentic as possible. So here's what Mac Mahone uh, says when he describes John Sedgwick. He was tall, ruddy complexion, blue eyes, a very smooth, silky voice, his hair growing rather long on his forehead with a long mustache and side whiskers. He always wore his boots under his pants. He wore an old-fashioned pair of brass spurs, never taking them off. He fairly used to sleep in them. His coat he kept open with his sword belt underneath. No vest, a gray flannel shirt, a black cravat tied under the collar. He wore a little round hat. So this gives us an image of what McMahon sees in his commanding officer day after day. So how he remembers him being at the Battle of Gettysburg. So Gary, we've got we've opened with a description about Uncle John Cedric. What do we got next? Well, I think I, thank thanks, Sarah. I think we need to do this more often. This is a great way because I don't know I was looking at some of the other people watching and I was getting a better picture of John Sedgwick just listening to that uh, something about hearing somebody reading it out loud too uh, really does it there and I really don't picture him as blue-eyed uh, pretty interesting stuff there uh, good camera work by Sarah oh man there's some algae and lichen on these rocks Real quick, we stand right between the 5th Corps Headquarters Marker and the 6th Corps Headquarters Marker at Gettysburg. These are the two units that kind of come and reinforce in part this part of the line over here. But we really need to get into this. We talk about the 5th Corps a lot at Gettysburg. We don't talk a lot about the 6th Corps or their history here. And man, happily we have somebody here with us who uh, would call the 6th Corps his jam. And that is Chris White of the American Battlefield Trust. What about the 6th Corps, sir? Uh? This is uh, loser level stuff right here. Bro. <laughs> Watch you out. see the word nerds, losers, and uh, anything else. Gary comes Buffs up Buffs and with. geeks. We got uh, it yes, there it is. Um, no, the Sixth Corps, uh, before Gettysburg, I'll talk about that, and we'll bring on Doug Dowds and Gary to talk a little bit more about them here. But the Sixth Corps is a corps that should never have existed in the Army of the Potomac. Uh, whenever Abraham Lincoln uh, helps to authorize the Army of the Potomac, his principal army here in the Eastern Theater, he created four infantry corps, the first through the fourth. But in May of 1862, George Britton McClellan, who is in charge of that army, wants to put two of his good friends in charge of corps. And unfortunately, the way the rank system works within the federal army, he can't bump anyone out of line. So he provisionally creates two corps, the fifth corps and the sixth corps. They're supposed to be temporary corps, and he does this in May of 1862. But those two corps will actually survive all the way up through Appomattox. Well, the first corps, the third corps, and the fourth corps never existed really after 1863 and then 1864. But the Corps itself will see action on the peninsula. Uh, it'll see some action at Antietam. Uh, one brigade will really be engaged just, uh, just to the south of the of the visitor center today, the modern day visitor center. And then during the Battle of Fredericksburg, a small portion of that Corps will be engaged. And at that point, it'll be under the command of William, uh, or at first, William Franklin, who was one of Mac's uh, friends. And then it will 
be under the command of a guy named Baldy Smith, William Baldy Smith. But in the wake of the Battle of Fredericksburg, the Sixth Corps turns into a massive headache for the new commander, or for the commander, Ambrose Burnside. In fact, two men, one man named John Cochran, another named John Newton, will go to the executive mansion, the White House, and meet with the president himself and say just how problematic Burnside's command of this army has become. And in the wake of Fredericksburg, as he's about to embark on a campaign before January 1st to 63, the president calls down to Burnside and tells him, you have a problem with your army. This is completely usurping the chain of command. This is, goes against military protocol, and this is a big problem. This is borderline mutiny. Um, Stephen, Ambro or Stephen uh, Sears calls this the revolt of the generals. Well, when there's a new commander in January of 1863, a guy named Joseph Hooker, Hooker sees that there are some problems with that Sixth Corps. He will ship out William Smith, its commander, as well as a few other lower-end subordinates, and bring in John Sedgwick on, on February 4th of 1863. When he arrives at his new headquarters to relieve Smith, um, one of the staff officers said, here came a quiet general with a staff officer as handsome as Romeo as he came up. <laughs> so apparently one of the staff officers for Sedgwick was pretty good looking. That could have been uh, uh, Mac, as he called his chief of staff. He will come in, he will relieve Smith of command, and then throughout the Chancellorsville campaign, John Sedgwick, who is 49 years old from Cornwall Hollow, Connecticut, uh, he is a veteran West Point graduate of the class of 1837. In fact, he was told, you'll never make it into West Point because you're, uh, you're not good at mathematics. And in fact, he graduates from the West Point class of 37 just about halfway through that class. He was, I think, 26 out of 50. Then. When Sedgwick comes into command, this is his first major command since the Battle of Antietam. He had been wounded three times in the West Woods, felled by fire, and now he is taking over the Union 6th Army Corps, which is the largest corps in the Union Army, numbering nearly 23,000 men just in the 6th Corps alone. Now, Joe Hooker, at the outset of the Chancellorsville campaign, will leave the 6th Corps, as well as his 1st, 3rd, and part of his 2nd Corps, around the Fredericksburg area. One of the reasons I believe that he does this is to keep that problem child of a corps, the Sixth Corps, a little bit farther away from him as he splits his army in two, comes in behind Robert E. Lee's forces at Chancellorsville, and then we have the great battle there. But ironically, John Sedgwick, who went from commanding a division of 5,400 men, now at, Chancellors, now at Chancellorsville, is commanding more than 60,000 men as a wing commander. Nothing prepares him for this, and he is not the guy to be in charge of an entire wing of the army. Great guy but he's slow moving in the McClellan fashion and he's steady, but he is not gonna think outside the box. That is not John Sedgwick for you. As the campaign goes on, more and more men will be pulled away from his wing of the army and Sedgwick will be at, uh, ordered to advance west on the evening of May 2nd into the morning of May 3rd at Chancellorsville. When he does so, his corps will take Marie's Heights and they will move on to a place called Salem Church. In the fallout from Chancellorsville, ironically, it's the Sixth Corps that is the corps that is going to put the only real um, star uh, on the Chancellorsville campaign for the Union Army. Everything else went awry, but they were able to take that famed Maurice Heights, one of the Gibraltars of the South. They were also able to push on and distract Lee's Army and open an opportunity for Joe Hooker, which he does not capitalize on. On May 24th, 1863, the Corps is shown atop Maurice Heights, the 6th Main, atop the famed Washington Artillery, seizing the cannons there at Maurice Heights. They sustain the highest number of casualties at, at Chancellorsville and then march off here towards Gettysburg, still the largest Corps in the Union Army, numbering about 18,000 men at the outset of the Gettysburg campaign. But John Sedgwick, he is now turning into a veteran Corps commander. He is one of the highest ranking officers here in the Army, and his Corps will be uh, basically pulling up the caboose for the Army of the Potomac as they come up here towards Gettysburg. This is a Corps who had seen some action in 1862, had been bloodied at Chancellorsville, won't see a lot of action here at Gettysburg, 
they'll see some action at a place called Rappahannock Station in late 1863, but in 1864, they're gonna see a heck of a lot of action as they move south in the Overland Campaign, and that'll be something we pick up on here in just a few minutes. Gary? All right, thanks, Chris. Excellent introduction here, and, uh, but you know, we're at Gettysburg. This is Gettysburg 160, uh, so we've gotta bring the Sixth Corps to Gettysburg. We've gotta talk about the fighting here, and Doug Dowds and I are gonna do that. So let's start out with Doug, licensed battlefield guide, and a whole lot more. Thanks, Gary. So. Uh, Chris gave us a wonderful setup when we think about this. Uh, Chris says they're bringing up the caboose. Actually, when we think about where the Sixth Corps is uh, when we get to July 1st, they will, uh, let's start down as they leave the Potomac. Uh, they will leave their encampments outside of Culpeper on the 14th of June. They're gonna cross the Potomac River on the 27th of June. They'll be in the vicinity of Manchester, Maryland. This is Meade's hedge against the prospect of Robert E. Lee turning the right flank of the Army of the Potomac. And if Meade had the opportunity to fall back on that Pipe Creek line, that would secure the very right of the Union Army. As Chris said, it's the largest corps. In this case, not 23,000. They're down to oh, just over 16,000. Of course, we know the fighting starts to develop here on the 1st of July. Meade will send all kind of orders out to catch Shedwick and says, I need you to get to Gettysburg as fast as you can, even by force marches. And of course, that's exactly Exactly what John Sedgwick was going to do. He's going to ride his horse Cornwall because that's where he's from, a nutmegger from uh, Connecticut, uh, and he's going to start to lead his forces this way, conducting a forced march. In fact, early on, they're going to they're going to get on a wrong road and go almost two miles out of the way before they make the decision. I'm going to cut those losses and get back on the Baltimore Pike because we'll be able to make the best time on that road. And of course, he's going to drive his corps. They talk about only taking stops to allow the men to relieve themselves. Even as they make those stops, they talk every now and then. Soldiers will try and build a quick fire that they might brew some coffee. And officers having to kick over the logs to get them back in line so that they can keep on moving. They're going to cross the Pennsylvania border at about mid-morning. And it won't be until about 1 o'clock in the afternoon of July 2nd that they finally take a stop for about an hour. Now is when they're going to let them uh, build fires, brew some coffee, have some food. Ultimately, they will start to arrive on the field here at Gettysburg at the southern end of the field about 6 o'clock in the evening. We know what's happening about 6 o'clock in the evening as the Union Center is starting to collapse, but they're arriving on the southern end of the field, and arguably they're going to start to show up over here at about... 6.30, 6.45 in the evening, the leading brigade being commanded by Colonel David Nevin, formerly the commander of the 93rd Pennsylvania, but we know when John Newton becomes the commander of the 1st Corps on the morning of July 2nd, that leads to a ripple of changes where Wheaton now has to become a division commander, and now a regimental commander has to become a brigade commander, and it's going to be his brigade that's going to arrive on this side of the field in about this vicinity starting about 6.45 in the evening, late afternoon. Great, right, thanks, Doug. You know, th there is a lot going on here. I mean, it's more than the collapse of the Union Center. At this point, this is a massive emergency here. Remember, Kershaw, Semmes, and Wofford, and Anderson have successfully cleared the wheat field. And by the way, you're looking uh, off in that direction toward Hawks Ridge. I can actually see Devil's Den from here, incredibly. And you can imagine the Confederates cresting that very hill, you know, off in the distance there and pushing toward Little Round Top in the Valley of Death. And then the relatively fresh brigade of William T. Wofford coming in this direction. The Union has some cannons over there. That's the 3rd Massachusetts Battery, uh, Aaron F. Walcott down there. And they were kind of, uh, I think somebody said, shanghaied by Dan Sickles to be put into that position. And here comes Wofford, and that's Nevin coming up there, right? Yeah, exactly. And so what we have is, and it's interesting, and we saw this, we started our stop here by saying, we are kind of between the headquarters of the 5th and 6th Corps. The 5th Corps has arrived over here. Remember, Meade calls on his only reserve. They start to show up here. We know about Colonel Strong Vincent going up here, but we also start to see the Pennsylvania Pennsylvania reserves here. Uh, in this case, under uh, Brigadier McCandless, uh, we normally think about Samuel Crawford leading his division. They will use that northern shoulder of Little Round Top as a springboard to launch counterattacks, and it's behind McCandless that we're ultimately going to find Nevin setting up his first line. Yeah, and it's interesting. If you picture McCandless over there, McCandless has got you know his four or five regiments, and they're charging down into the Valley of Death, and Nevin's brigade, this used to be Wheaton's brigade again, uh, you know, sort of split with the 98th Pennsylvania on one side of the reserves, and
and then you've got, you know, uh, uh, three other units. Uh, they're missing one of theirs, 102nd Pennsylvania's back down at Westminster. And then you've got the 139th Pennsylvania, the 93rd New York, and I think the 62nd New York, if I'm correct, maybe 61st, uh, is, is off along the Weikert Lane. And they're going to charge in. Now, the important part here is that the Union's going to suffer some casualties here. Uh, the Union, the 98th Pennsylvania, charging down Little Round Top, essentially, with the reserves. One guy named George Stiles gets a bullet lodged in his head, and they remove it along with 17 pieces of his skull. I pulled his pension record oh and saw that. He survives, gets a pension, $9 a month. Um, <laughs> and then you've got the reserves kind of taking that area. But over here, it's a massive emergency. Wofford's guys have actually come across uh, Air and F Walcott's battery. They've captured five of the six guns, if not all of them. Only one of them was spiked. So this is an emergency here. Yeah, moreover, when we think about it, uh, Wofford thinks that they are making progress. We talk about the wheat field changing hands six times. It's as he comes down that wheat field road that he's going to clean that out for the last time. And now he's actually going to be leaning away from the threat. And oh, by the way, as Gary mentioned, there's part of better than three Confederate brigades that are coming over Hawks Ridge. So it makes sense that he's leaning this direction. So when McCandless goes in that valley, Nevin, waiting for the next brigade to come up, this would be Bartlett's brigade, also of the 6th Corps, will be given orders to slide to the north. Bartlett is going to complain about this later on. If he cuts us off. But what they are doing is effectively extending those Pennsylvania Reserve lines to the north. And they can, well, we can see their monuments from where they start their attack off to our right. And we can see actually their monuments down along the Weikert Lane where they drive down there. Nevin says that they give one, then two volleys. And Wofford's men report it's those two volleys for the first time they felt checked. Yeah. And but luckily for the Union at that point, they you know, the Confederate attack, according to one of the Yankees over there, said the Confederate attack looked like a wave breaking on a beach with not much power behind it. This was not the roaring wave 100 yards out. This was something going a little up and a little back. The Confederate attack was pretty much spent by this time. Wofford may be the only semi-fresh group here. It's a great point. When we think about uh, Kershaw and... Um uh, Sem's Brigade that have been fighting, you know, south of the Peach Orchard through the wheat field. They have suffered dramatic casualties. And we think about the losses of leadership and the disorganization of those units when these powerful counterattacks come from the high ground. You can see why that shares significant stopping power. And could you imagine that uh, I'm going to move on a little bit and we'll probably start walking in a second because what a great part of the battlefield. We got to make our way that way too. Um, you know, the Sixth Corps arrives on the field, largest one, as you said, and then here we go. Uh, as soon as they arrive, they start to get parceled out. If you look at their second division, Grant and Neal, they're on precise opposite sides of the line on the near the round tops and, and you know, opposite Culp's Hill. Uh, when you look at uh, even this division, Newton's or Wheaton's division, you know, they're sort of staying together. But you look at the first one, Torbert and Russell are not really connected very well with Bartlett. This is a great, it's a really great point. And you can feel John Sedgwick's frustration at this uh, as he watches his core distributed all around the field. He says, I might as well just go home. This this also speaks to how Meade is fighting the Army. They know they're fighting on the defensive with all the cracks in the dam that is the Army of the Potomac on July 2nd. He's using these pieces to plug holes all around the line. And when we think about O'Neill over on the far Union uh, right, when we think about Grant on the left, we normally think about a fish hook and a 270 degree defense. By the time those units fall in on the evening of July 2nd, it's almost a 360 degree defense. If you think that George Gordon Meade and the Army of the Potomac hasn't learned that a sly Robert E. Lee will find some way to get on a flank. Look at where those units are posted. And ultimately, we even know on July 3rd, Shaler's Brigade will be part of uh, the attack to re uh, reclaim Culp's Hill. Uh, they'll be part of the numbers that allow that sustained fighting for seven hours over on Culp's Hill on July 3rd. Yeah, and around that time, a little after that, you have Nevin's Brigade again moving forward with the Pennsylvania Reserves, recapturing a lot of those guns, so helping to capture, recapture Bigelow's guns maybe, although that might be the 12th Corps as well as, you know, some of the other guns that have been captured there. So you've got the 6th Corps advancing all over the place. Their batteries are even more well distributed or poorly distributed in terms of organization at that point. So, I mean, anything else on the 6th Corps here? Uh, I just think it's an interesting point because what it really gets to is the grand what if. After Pickett's charge fails, we talk about the opportunity for Meade to launch a counterattack. If possible, we're standing on the only ground that it could have been launched from. And we have an informal uh, council of war that takes place up on Little Round Top with uh, Pleasanton, Sykes, Sedgwick, because this is really the only troops, and when we look at casualties, the only ones that he has available to use to counterattack. But let's face it, the 6th Corps has been distributed all across the rest of the 
army to defend this position. They have not been keep, kept together to be a mailed fist to launch some counterattack. Moreover, for the Confederates that they would have had to attack, they were not fighting on July 3rd. They were well placed for the defensive, and ultimately that attack or the counterattack ends up being an armed reconnaissance that really leads to no action, mostly because of the decisions that took place on the 2nd of July. Good. Excellent, Doug. I think, you know, maybe we'll hope to nudge you a little in the direction of, you know, study the 6th Corps at Gettysburg. A lot of people don't, uh, you know, to the exclusion, you know, they study the other things to the exclusion of the 6th because they didn't suffer as many casualties. But if you start looking around the field on late July 2nd and then mainly into July 3rd, you see the 6th Corps making a lot of difference in a lot of places. Now, I think we're going to do a little switch up here because we're going to move beyond Gettysburg and talk more about John Sedgwick. You probably know what's coming. And we got something special coming again from the West Point Museum. And you're with the American Battlefield Trust. So I think we're going to swap cameras out there. I think Chris is going to grab Doug's mic and Chris is going to go back to his jam. John Sedgwick, let me let me tell you here, it's probably not going to be an upper. Yeah, and I just want to uh, tip in to what Doug and Gary were saying. I mean, a fantastic job of unpacking. this. That was nerd level for Gettysburg right there. <laughs> I mean, this is some real stuff. If you want to study for the guide test, if you want to learn more about Gettysburg, this is the stuff that you will eventually get into whenever you start learning more about the core division, brigade levels, and now you're getting down into that regimental. Um, but one thing I wanted to mention is that the chain of command of the 6th Corps has been changed, uh, as Doug pointed out. I, I challenge you to keep up with the chain of command the Army of the Potomac starting on the morning of July 1st until it ends. I mean, it's bumping everyone all around, and I have to give them a lot of credit. They are working like a well-oiled machine together. This is what you saw whenever it, the Army of Northern Virginia was at its height with Jackson, Longstreet, and Stewart as that triumvirate uh, under Lee. Now here, we're seeing a well-oiled machine. After Chancellorsville, one man of the 12th United States Infantry who fought right down in here, he said, we did not defeat, but we were not defeated. And that's how that army came here with a chip on its shoulder. But the 6th Army Corps, as it approached here, had some new division commanders. The 1st Division uh, was once under a guy named Bully Brooks. Uh, Bully Brooks uh, at at the Battle of Salem Church, we'll say, 25 years in the Army, Mr. Wheeler, and it's all up for me. Uh, he'll be sh shipped out to the Department of the Monongahela out near Pittsburgh. So we have a new guy named Horatio Wright in charge. Second Corps is under a guy named Albion Paris Howe, who does not like John Sedgwick much at all, especially in the post-war years. Then we have um, uh, another division. We have another, they're pointing me in a direction. Uh, we have our third division, which was under John Newton, is now going to be under a guy named Frank Wheaton. Wheaton's father-in-law is a guy named Samuel Cooper, who is the highest ranking Confederate general uh, because that army or that, that family has been split. And now we have split these guys off in all kinds of different positions. So we have new guys, uh, we have new commanders in new positions, all being now parceled out into some different areas. And John Sedgwick, uh, who was a veteran commander by this point, this is only his second command as a corps commander. Now he's lost most of his men. To tell you a little bit about what Robert E. Lee thought of John Sedgwick, at the Battle of Second Fredericksburg, whenever he finds out that John Sedgwick has broken in through his rear, there's a guy named Brother William of the 17th Mississippi. He comes riding in, into Lee's camp. He's like, oh, man, this everything's going bad. It's terrible. It's going bad. Like that. And Lee says, calm down. Go sit there. About five minutes later, Lee walks over and says, now tell me about what's happening. And he says, John Sedgwick's broken through our rear, blah, 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 all this stuff. And Lee will stop him and say, I believe that Major Sedgwick means us no harm. He's not referring to Major General John Sedgwick. He's referring to his former executive officer in the old U.S. CAV. He, is, he knows the cut of the jib of John Sedgwick. He knows how slow he is, and he knows he has time to now react. And that will be the John Sedgwick that we will start to see throughout some of the 1864 campaigns. Now, his Sixth Corps will be used extensively as we go into late 1863, early 1864. At the Brock Road, Plank Road intersection at the Battle of the Wilderness, it will be George Washington Getty's men right, or running into that intersection to seize it, to hold it, and to keep the line towards Richmond wide open. The Vermont Brigade will suffer 1,234 casualties over the next two days, taking some of the highest casualties there at that battle. And the VI Corps will pay in blood for the battles that they missed in 62 and 63. By May 9th of 1864, they are on the outskirts of Spotsylvania Courthouse, Virginia. They'll be establishing a line of, con uh, of countervallation around the Confederate line that's been established there. And as they are establishing that line, John Sedgwick is told by his chief of staff, do not go down to the front, General, because he loved going down to the front. Sedgwick was a guy who would always joke with his men. The Battle of the Wilderness, in fact, one man was decapitated and a man was hit 
with a head of another man. He was splattered with brains, and this man falls off of his horse, this staff officer, and as he stands up, he looks around, thinking there might be his own blood. John Sedgwick starts to joke with him about not losing his head uh, being on that battlefield. So John Sedgwick is a guy who is affable. He liked to play solitaire, but he also had a temper on him. At one point during a campaign, he was very angered about something. He goes and lays in a hay field, and he goes to sleep, and it begins to rain. His chief of staff says, go put a tent fly over him, a big piece of canvas. And he wakes up, finding out that there's no rain on his head, and he says, who told you to put that up? Take it down. I want the rain to cool me off. That was the kind of officer John Sedgwick was. But unfortunately, he was also hands-on. And on the morning of May 9th, 1864, even though he's told not to go to the front lines, he moves forward to a battery to help reposition it, to also to inspire his men not to duck, not to dodge these different uh, Whitworth bullets that are coming in at him from Confederate sharpshooters when he is struck in the head and killed instantly in Spotsylvania Courthouse. He's the highest ranking United States officer to fall during the Civil War. People will say it's James Burgey McPherson, but by date of rank, John Sedgwick outranks him. And that's what matters in the U.S. Army in 1864. John Sedgwick, his body will be taken back to Connecticut where he's buried. But unfortunately for John Sedgwick, he left us with some of the worst last words of any officer on a Civil War battlefield. He will say something along the lines of, they couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. And in a moment later, John Sedgwick's life was ended by a Whitworth bullet through his skull. Sedgwick, he is remembered at other places, mostly for Antietam, for being wounded three times in the West Woods. He's remembered as Uncle John Sedgwick, and he's remembered sadly for that last phrase that he uttered on his last day on Earth. Gary? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Excellent and powerful, if I may add. Um, let's walk a little closer up here and bring on our, our good friend. You're, you've probably gotten to like him already for some of the experiences we've already got to have. And we've shot a lot of things at West Point uh, that we're still yet to post. But this is Aaron Rowland. He's uh, with the West Point Museum. And Aaron, uh, I think people are going to be interested to see uh, what you have today. I'm almost trying to string it out to increase the anticipation. Yes, Gary. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for uh, for having us. It's uh, it's already been a an action packed, exciting weekend, and we're only like halfway through. So there's a lot more excitement to come. I mean, yesterday afternoon we had a line out the door at uh, at Adams County Historical Society at their Battle uh, Beyond the Battle Museum. So great place. We'll be there this afternoon. Uh, so. Uh, we hope you'll come visit us. Of yeah, course, we're not we're, live we're right not now. We're not live, so I apologize. by the time you see this. Yeah. <laughs> my mistake, my mistake. I, uh, I do apologize. Adams County's newest museum. Yes. Yes. You may have not, you may have not have yet been there. My apologies. Uh, but so we're talking about John, uh, Uncle John Sedgwick. Now, uh, being a very renowned uh, Army officer, of course, we have in our collections at the West Point Museum uh, many notable artifacts. So I think we should talk about a little bit uh, the the memory of uh, Uncle John uh, when it comes to uh, how his memory and his legacy are preserved. So it is unfortunate that his last words were so. Uh, catastrophic to his uh, to his reputation but it should be noted that uh, just uh, four short years after the uh, his his, uh, his death in 1864 they did they did build a statue the men of the sixth corps built a statue to his memory uh, there at West Point so today visitors to West Point when you come see us come see us at the West Point Museum uh, you'll you'll be able to see that uh, when you go on post, you'll be able to see right there on Trophy Point, across from the Battle Monument, the monument to uh, General Sedgwick. Now, there is a little bit of folklore, uh, a little bit of legend that goes along with it. So, legend has it that should a cadet not be doing so so well uh, during their their T exams, their term and uh, term ending exams, uh, they will get together, they'll put together their full dress uniform, they'll get dressed and they'll go and they'll stand and they'll, they'll spin the spurs on uh, General Sedgwick's his, uh, his monument there. And that should bring them good luck on their, their exams. So a little bit of, uh, a little bit of uh, legend there, but we can tell you that he is missing a spur because people have been spinning it. So please don't touch monuments. We just ask that you observe them. They are to the memory of such men as Uncle John. So don't touch them. Uh, but we do also have many other relics. Now, 
We have General Sedgwick's sword that he might have been carrying uh, when he was uh, when he was uh, mortally wounded at uh, at Spotsylvania Courthouse. We have his saddle, uh, and some of these items were donated by, for instance, his daughter, uh, and it went down through the generations, uh, as well as uh, one of his staff members, Emery Upton, who also served here at Gettysburg, class of 1861. Now, one item that we have here on display. You might be able to see behind me, but why don't we take a, take a walk up with Eric? Heck Gary. yeah, for sure. By the way, as we walk, let me give congratulations to newlywed Aaron Rowland, who was married uh, just two months ago, him and his now wife, of course, in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Yes, uh, yes, thank you, thank you. Shout out to Lexi, happy, uh, happy one month, just over one month. So, uh, Gary, I wanted to just make one quick note here. I was looking at the hat while we were standing down there just now, and I couldn't help but think that this hat looks very much like Sam Elliott's Buford hat in the movie. Yeah, and you know, and this is the <laughs> real deal. I mean, Sam's, I love Sam Elliott's portrayal, but uh, this is just a beautiful piece. It honestly looks like Gary's hat. Yeah, well, but you know, you see, I have, a, I have a tiny little head, <laughs> yeah. as you see, so I can't rock a Sedgwick. So is it, uh, is it safe to say that uh, Uncle John helped hold the high ground? <laughs> sure, I'll take that for sure. <laughs> so what do we know about the hat, Aaron? So there, there is uh, there is provenance to the uh, the hat. We do know that the hat belonged to uh, to General Sedgwick. In fact, it was donated by uh, Emory Upton when he was a general officer in the regular Army of the United States. So uh, General Upton donated the hat and the the uh, the saddle that he had during that fateful day in uh, in Spotsylvania Courthouse in 1864. Uh, but what we know about the hat is that. It did belong to him. Now, we do know that he's wearing a very similar hat on the monument here in Gettysburg. There is some speculation that this is the hat that he, uh, he was wearing on that fateful day, but unfortunately, there are so many different accounts, and we were just discussing that this morning, uh, about what he was wearing, how he was dressed, and generally what he was doing. So I think, Chris, why don't I turn it over to you to, uh, to give us a little background on that? Yeah, so as Sarah pointed out, you know, he was a very plain dressed general most of the time. Um, you know, he would have a basically a, a private sack coat. He would wear it open. He wouldn't wear a sash or anything. He had uh, his pants with his spurs. He always had riding spurs on and always wore riding boots. But the hats are, are kind of different. Uh, because in writing with his chief of staff, an artist who's trying to design some things here at Gettysburg and get things right, he was very much a perfectionist, this artist, um, he said that, um, that Cedric was wearing a little brown hat, um, just like that, with a ribbon around it. And he said, did he wear it at Gettysburg? He said, I believe he did. He either wore that or a fatigue cap. Perhaps you had better put him in a fatigue cap, uh, which is more of what we think of as a, as a um, sla or not a slouch hat, but a, um, a, a bummer, a forge, yeah, a forge a cap. Bummer, yeah, yeah. Um, a forge cap. And uh, so this potentially could have been worn by him here. His staff officer, who was writing 20-ish years after, didn't exactly remember what the general had on that day. There were a lot of things going on. There's orders going in and out of headquarters. He would have seen the general, but remember, even if it wasn't on Sedgwick proper, we have baggage trains. Uh, not all of them made them here to Gettysburg, but they would have been with the with the army. In fact, um, Aaron showed us, and I think I have the assets in there, Sarah, if you want to show it. He also had a fantastic camp chair that he, that he brought along. He had a beautiful liquor box um, with all these, which uh, very ornately painted uh, um, bottles. You know, so these things, if they weren't with General Sedgwick proper, um, they would have been within the vicinity of Gettysburg, I think is the fair fair way to say it. I think it's a really good point. And when we think about, you know, how does a, a plainly dressed general would have, well, if you just got 36 miles and drove your men here, I don't know that you're wearing your sash, your sword, and your favorite hat. Uh, I think you're kind of worn out, you're sweating it out, you're all pitted out. And when we take his personality along with the mission that they had been given when they arrive here, I think, uh, you know, the, certainly the setting that we see there is an a very idealized one. But perhaps it is idealized in the same sense as Chris talked us through the death of uh, Sedgwick. You know, when, when Sedgwick, when Ulysses S. Grant is told that Sedgwick has been killed, he asks twice, say that again. And then what he ultimately says is, uh, the death of Sedgwick is worth at least a division of troops. 
because while not brilliant, he was dependable. Absolutely. Uh, and so what we see is, I, I, I am struck by having seen the pictures of his saddle. It's immaculate. It's dependable. The hat, still in great condition. All, all these things speak volumes about someone who will show up and deliver on the day necessary. Maybe not brilliant, but you can always count them on being there. And in that sense, his troops loved him, and the other peers around him seem to also count on him. Yeah, and I, I would just tip in, you know, there's something to be said for morale with a leader. Um, you know, here with Barksdale's charge going across, that is a call to personality with those Mississippians coming across that field. With the Sixth Corps, it was very much that call to personality. In fact, the, the man who was supposed to take over the Sixth Corps actually turned it down initially and because he didn't want to take it over, and it goes to Horatio Wright. It goes back to what a sergeant said about Ike before D-Day. He said his smile's worth 20 divisions. There you go. And with Sedgwick, I think just his name alone was worth that. He joked with his men. He endured the hardships with them. So maybe he wasn't, believe me, he didn't think outside the box. But if you gave him orders, he would do his best to go and carry those orders out to the letter. Um, and do remember, West Point was an engineering school first and foremost. Uh, so engineers think very in a very linear uh linear sense a linear sense um but with sedgwick also as doug pointed out this is our idealized version of what john sedgwick looks like and you can actually pull a fantastic um pamphlet off of archive.org that uh talks about the dedication of this monument we have the saint andrew's cross or the greek cross here um down in the in the rocks that they created here he's flanked by four of those and this is to their beloved commander so this is how they want to remember john sedgwick and now mac who knew him a little bit better wanted to remember him as the guy who played solitaire the guy who joked with people the guy with a ruddy complexion and who had a pretty hot staff officer, apparently, as well. Um, <laughs> that's how that's how he uh, liked to remember John Sedgwick. And Sedgwick, um, you know, for all of his faults at, at times on a battlefield, you know, maybe he wasn't fast enough for Joe Hooker at Chancellorsville. Maybe he wasn't fast enough sometimes for George Gordon Meade during the Gettysburg campaign. He always would come up to the battlefield ready for action. He did that at Chancellorsville. Joe Hooker screwed that one up. George Gordon Meade, I think we can give him a pass for losing so many corps commanders here. Um, but John Sedgwick during the Overland campaign, whenever the rubber met the road, his sixth corps really put in a lot of fighting along with the Union Second Army Corps. So, Chris, do you think it's safe to say that uh, Uncle John during the uh, the Battle of Gettysburg might have partaken in some libations from that lovely liquor cabinet that we have in our collections? I don't want to say that he Joe Hookered it, um, <laughs> but yes, I, I would imagine that that he would have one. Now we have we do have accounts of George Gordon Meade uh, sitting at his uh, council of war with them sitting a bottle of of liquor in front of him, wanting him to take a drink. Like General, I think you need a drink, and Meade wanting to make sure everybody could have a drink kind of begged off on that um but there are there are comments out here there's a, a battery commander named ames out here who actually hands his flask to a man who was wounded in the foot and he drank it and he thought he was going to drink it as well as the whole flask <laughs> so there's drinking on the battlefield was john sedgwick out here drinking uh, maybe, maybe not. They were glass bottles. But I would imagine after this victory here at Gettysburg, or at least on the March South, they would have been bought on, on something. Uh, we do know uh, that at the uh, old Snyder Wagon Hotel, that the men who took that place over took out like 38 gallons of whiskey, five gallons of gin, all this. So there was drinking going on during the Gettysburg Soldiers campaign. will be soldiers. Soldiers will be soldiers. <laughs> but um, Aaron, anything else you would like to add? Well, I would just like to add that uh, this really plays into the fact that after the war, there there was a, a significant effort to preserve uh, General Sedgwick's Uncle John's uh, memory. Uh, aside from his legacy that is that uh that quote so uh we we do have many other items that belong to general sedgwick of course the the wicker cabinet his hat uh his uh his his saddle as well as his sword that came to us through his uh his daughter later on so we do have uh many artifacts and one of my favorite actually it as as small and uh, menial as it might seem but his camp chair uh yeah. so you can see the indentation of where general sedgwick as much of a man in the saddle as he really was and getting out there and having his soldiers taken care of before himself. It is tangible, it's a tangible connection to me, uh, more so than maybe a hat or a saddle because you can see the physical impression that the man left. And not only that, we have his lasting legacy at West Point that we, we, love, to, uh, we love to honor and we hope it will endure. And, and let me just close by saying he was a bachelor all of his life. 
Sedgwick. Um, we lost many of his early mementos and papers in a house fire. He sent everything back to his parents. The house burned down, unfortunately, so we lost a lot of his Mexican-American war papers. He fought at Cherubusco. He fought at Chapultepec. He was breveted for bravery two times. He was out on the plains. He fought in the Seminole Wars. Um, but unfortunately, we lose part of his life. Chris, if uh, I, if I yeah. may, too, uh, I it occurred to me just now that I, I said his daughter, I'm used to talking about daughters, it was his sister, sister that the, uh, his sister that uh, donated his his sword to the army and not his daughter. My uh, my apologies for that mistake. So. No, no problem. We're doing this off the cuff and it was yes, Emily Sedgwick Welsh was his sister um, and she keeps uh, his correspondence and actually she corresponds. One of the reasons we know so much about John Sedgwick is because not only does she correspond with John, she corresponds with his staff officers as well. Um, and that way we have this correspondence two-way street and we're getting a, a glimpse into John Sedgwick from a few different angles. Uh, but John Sedgwick killed in action May 9th, 1864 at the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse. He does have a monument here on the Gettysburg Battlefield. It's on Munshower's Knoll, which is just north of, of Little Round Top. And the next hill down is Swisher's Hill. That's where the New Jersey Brigade Monument is, um, which is a really cool monument. So if you ever have a chance, don't just drive past these monuments. Check out Elijah Hunt Roads and that second Rhode Island, famed from Ken Burns series. Their monuments here. The 10th Massachusetts have a beautiful monument down here. And General Sykes Headquarters uh, Cannon as well as Sedgwick's is here. And of course, we have Uncle John Sedgwick's monument here at Gettysburg. On behalf of the American Battlefield Trust, I want to thank Aaron Rowland and the West Point Museum for bringing these artifacts here to Gettysburg. This is a fantastic behind the scenes opportunity. This is not something we normally get to do. So thank you. This is probably the first time this hat has been on the Gettysburg Battlefield or in the Gettysburg vicinity since 1863. We have Doug Dowd's uh, licensed battlefield guide, Gary Edelman, uh, and we also have Sarah Byerly behind the camera. I'm Chris White. I want to thank you for watching. Thank you for supporting battlefield preservation, education. Check everything out at battlefields.org. Click that subscribe button as well as that bell notification.